Hello and welcome to the online lecture on hemodynamic monitoring. The objectives of this lecture are as follows. Differentiate the different types of lines used in hemodynamic monitoring. Understand the indications, contraindications, and complications of each type of line used in hemodynamic monitoring. Become familiar with invasive hemodynamic monitoring setup and maintenance. And finally, apply hemodynamic variables to the physiology of the heart. Before we discuss the different types of lines, let's talk about some general line indications. There are three broad indications for line placement, the first of which is impaired cardiac function. This can occur in acute myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, or cardiomyopathy. The second indication is shock. This can occur with cardiogenic shock, hypovolemic shock, or any of the forms of distributive shock. The third indication is decreased urinary output. Urinary output is an indirect measurement of cardiac output. Situations where urinary output may be decreased suggesting the need for line placement includes dehydration, hemorrhage, gastrointestinal bleeding, burns, and surgery. There are three different lines that we'll be discussing. The central line, the pulmonary artery catheter, sometimes referred to as a swan gans, and the arterial line. Let's begin our comparison by looking at the indications and contraindications of each line. The central line can be used for IV access, advanced access, such as with aggressive fluid resuscitation or medication administration, procedures such as plasmapheresis, dialysis, or aquapheresis, hemodynamic monitoring, and frequent blood draws. Contraindications to central line placement include sepsis, cellulitis, decreased platelets, and coagulopathy. The pulmonary artery catheter is indicated in right ventricular pathology, pulmonary hypertension, and post-cardiac surgery. The contraindications for a pulmonary artery catheter are the same as with a central line. An arterial line is primarily used for blood pressure monitoring and could also be used for arterial blood sampling and strict titration of vasoactive drugs. It's contraindicated when there's an absent pulse in the extremity being used, Berger or Raynaud's disease, full thickness burns, or poor circulation. Now let's take a look at line measurements and complications. The central line can measure central venous pressure and mixed oxygen saturation. Complications of a central line include pneumothorax, arrhythmias, air embolisms, infection, thrombosis, and vessel damage. The pulmonary artery catheter can provide probably the most information. It can measure cardiac output, temperature, pulmonary artery pressure, mixed venous oxygen saturation, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, central venous pressure, and systemic vascular resistance. Complications of the pulmonary artery catheter include air embolisms, arrhythmias, infection, thrombosis, pulmonary artery rupture, hypotension, and hypoxia. Finally, the arterial line measures blood pressure and mean arterial pressure. Complications of the arterial line include thrombosis, infection, hematoma, arterial dissection, and medication or air injection. In order to set up this system, you need a bedside monitor, a pressurized bag of fluids, a transducer which converts pressure into electrical signals that you can read on the bedside monitor, non-distensible tubing, and the line itself.
In order to ensure proper readings, the system must be leveled and zeroed. The transducer should be leveled with what's referred to as the flebostatic axis. This can be found using a level. The flebostatic axis is the intersecting line from the fourth intercostal space mid-axillary line. Once leveled, open the transducer to air and zero the monitor to atmospheric pressure. This should be done before each use, with each change in patient position, and when there are questionable waveforms or readings. Now let's discuss the hemodynamic variable starting with cardiac output. Cardiac output is the amount of blood ejected from one ventricle in one minute. It's normally 4 to 8 liters per minute and is determined by heart rate and stroke volume. Cardiac index is cardiac output adjusted for body surface area or BSA. And because not all blood is ejected from the ventricles during systole, an ejection fraction measures the percent of ejected blood. Heart rate is normally 60 to 100 beats per minute and is primarily determined by three different factors. Vagus nerve stimulation results in a decreased heart rate. Accelerator nerve stimulation results in an increased heart rate. Catecholamines such as epinephrine and norepinephrine can also influence heart rate. And finally, the electrical properties of the myocardium. Stroke volume is the amount of blood ejected from the ventricle with each heartbeat. It's normally 50 to 100 milliliters and can be determined by the equation cardiac output times 1,000 divided by heart rate. There are three things that determine stroke volume, preload, afterload, and contractility. Let's start by looking at preload. I like to think of preload as stretch. It's the filling pressure of the ventricles at the end of diastole, related to the amount of blood that fills the ventricles during diastole. This process is related to the frank starling law, which emphasizes the ability of the heart to change its force of contraction, and therefore stroke volume, in response to changes in venous return. Let's look at a graph demonstrating this principle. On the y-axis, we have stroke volume, and on the x-axis, we have ventricular pressure. In this case, left ventricular end diastolic pressure. A normal curve can be drawn showing the relationship between ventricular pressure and stroke volume. Increasing venous return results in an increased filling pressure, which results in an increased stroke volume. On the other hand, decreasing venous return results in a decreased filling pressure and thereby a decreased stroke volume. I want to emphasize that this process is strongly driven by venous return. There are two common measurements of preload. Central venous pressure, or CVP, looks at the right side of the heart. This provides an estimate of the amount of blood returning to the right side of the heart. On the other hand, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, or PCWP, looks at the left side of the heart and is an estimate of the amount of blood returning to the left side of the heart. Central venous pressure is normally 2 to 8 millimeters of mercury. Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is normally 8 to 12 millimeters of mercury. Now let's take a look at afterload. I like to think of afterload as resistance. This is the load that the heart must eject blood against. In other words, how hard the heart has to push in order to get the blood out. So if you think about the ventricles working against a given pressure, 
Just by looking at this image, you can imagine that afterload has a lot to do with the pulmonary valve and artery, as well as the aortic valve and the aorta. In this image, you can also see that afterload is inversely related to stroke volume. You won't be able to eject as much blood out of the ventricle if the resistance or afterload is high. As a side note, blood pressure is related to afterload, but it's not the same thing. It's cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance that determine blood pressure. Some things that determine afterload include vascular resistance, which is the primary component, valve compliance, blood viscosity, aortic compliance, and arterial wall compliance. Let's look at a common consequence of afterload. As the ventricles are stressed, there are one of two results. When there is pressure overload, for instance with hypertension or aortic stenosis, New sarcomeres are assembled as a result of signals to increase protein synthesis. This increase in protein synthesis and sarcomere quantity results in pressure overload hypertrophy of the heart with a thickened ventricle. When this occurs, there's a shared tension due to the arrangement of sarcomeres resulting in decreased wall stress and therefore decreased afterload. When there is volume overload on the heart, new sarcomeres are formed within existing sarcomeres, resulting in volume overload hypertrophy within a dilated ventricle. When this occurs, there is poorly managed tension due to the arrangement of sarcomeres, resulting in increased wall stress and therefore increased afterload. The goal of these two processes is to compensate for the force against the ventricle. In all of physiology, there's an inverse relationship between pressure and volume, meaning that if you increase volume, you will decrease pressure and vice versa. You can also see this relationship on a graph applied to the Frank-Starling law. With a decreased afterload, there is more stroke volume and less ventricular pressure. With an increased afterload, there is decreased stroke volume and increased pressure. There are two ways that afterload is measured. The first is through systemic vascular resistance, which reflects left ventricular afterload. This is an estimate of the average resistance to flow throughout the systemic circulation. The closest you can get to non-invasive measurement of systemic vascular resistance is by diastolic blood pressure. Pulse pressure is also used to assess systemic vascular resistance and an acute decrease in pulse pressure or narrowing of pulse pressure represents an increase in systemic vascular resistance. The second measurement of afterload is pulmonary vascular resistance which reflects right ventricular afterload. This is an estimate of the average resistance to flow throughout the pulmonary circulation. A non-invasive method of assessment for pulmonary vascular resistance is hypoxemia and acidosis, which result in an increased pulmonary vascular resistance. A normal systemic vascular resistance is 800 to 1200 dynes. A normal pulmonary vascular resistance is less than 200 dynes. The last hemodynamic variable we will look at is contractility, or the squeeze. Contractility is the velocity and extent of myocardial fiber shortening independent of preload and afterload. Its effectiveness is, however, related to the degree of myocardial fiber stretch, or preload, and wall tension, or afterload. Contractility is also referred to as the inotropic state. Contractility can also be represented in the graphical representation of the Frank-Starling law. If you increase inotropy, you will have a higher stroke volume and reduced ventricular pressure.
If you decrease inotropy, you will have a lower stroke volume and a higher ventricular pressure. Contractility can be measured invasively through a pulmonary artery catheter using the stroke volume index or SVI or a calculation of the right or left ventricular stroke work index. It can be measured non-invasively through echocardiogram or nuclear imaging. Factors influencing contractility include the sympathetic nervous system and adrenal glands by way of catecholamines, ventricular muscle mass, alterations in metabolic state, and medications, particularly inotropes. This concludes the lecture on hemodynamic monitoring. I hope you enjoyed it.